Hello everyone and welcome to Acrylic Code. Today we have a new over two hour long beginner tutorial covering everything you need to know about Touch Designer. Now the way this video is going to be structured is in the beginning I'm going to explain how you can download it and then we're going to start with the interface and then we're going to move on to each operator family. And the way I'm going to explain the operator families is I'm going to take examples of a bunch of operators and I'm going to show examples on how you can use them and what you can achieve with them and then after I have explained a bunch of operators I'm going to give you an assignment. This assignment will either be an image or a visual of some sort and the way that you can recreate the assignment and control whether you've understood the operators or not is by using the operators that I have explained up to that point. Before we move on to the actual tutorial, please like and subscribe so that we can keep making tutorials like this for free. Please check out our Instagram and Twitter account, I will leave the links below. And if you'd like to support us in making more of these videos and being more active on YouTube, please consider donating to our PayPal. I will also leave the link for it down below. Okay, now let's move on. In order to download the software, we go to this website derivative.ca slash download. And then once we're here, before we'll be able to download, we first need to go to my account here and create a new account. Once you created your new account and validated your email, you'll be able to download Touch Designer for Windows or Mac. So you just click on the operating system you have and then you save the file and from here you just follow the installation steps. Once you're done with all the installation steps and first open Touch Designer, this is what you'll see. In here, you will put the username and password you just created on the website in order to log in. Once you're logged in, you select here the commercial use and then click on create key. And there we go. Now we can start. I will select all of this and delete it for now and we'll move on with the tutorial. start with the interface. When you first open Touch Designer, you should see something like this, or there might also be a couple of operators here. If that is the case, you can select all the operators while holding down the shift key and delete them with the backspace key. Now we're going to start from bottom to top. There are a lot of buttons here, but for this tutorial I'm going through the most important ones and the ones that I personally mostly use. At the bottom of the interface we have the timeline. This part of the timeline holds the time code display and the transport controls. Here we can stop the time, go back to the beginning, with the plus and minus we can go to the next or previous frame, which is shown here as frames and also here as seconds. Using the range limit buttons, the timeline can be set to loop or to play through once and then stop. Here you can set the end frame, which gives us the overall length of the project and where it says FPS in here, we can set the frame rate in frames per second. Here we can also manually type in the frame we want to display and the frame rate can also be set manually. Now we notice that on the 400th frame, if I go and set the frame rate to 30, the time will automatically also change accordingly to the frame rate. This covers the facts we need for now. When we have a project later, we will come back to this to better illustrate what everything is actually doing. Here on the left part, we have our palette, which we can open and close with this little button on the top. The palette is a collection of useful components that you can drag and drop onto your network. Here, there is not only a large number of pre-existing touch designer components that are available, all bundled into categories up here, but you can also create components yourself that you often use and save them up here to spare yourself the effort and time for future projects. For now, let's close up the palette and we'll come back to it later with a concrete example. Here we have our pane bar. You can access pane options and navigate networks in Touch Designer. Next to the address bar, there are a number of buttons. The one on the far left lets us select the type of pane, which is this area right here in the center, and you'll see that we'll mostly be switching between top viewer and network editor. More on this later and why we need this switch. The address bar in the center of the pane bar tells us which network we are currently working in. In Touch Designer, the nodes are in a hierarchical level and every node has a network path. The path is the location of an operator within the hierarchy of a Touch Designer project. Think of this in the same way you think of the directory file relationships in your computer. If the path starts with a slash, it is an absolute path, which refers back to the top root of the hierarchy. If we click on this home button next to the path, it will bring us back to the root network. This is our base component and whenever we open a new touch designer file, this is how it starts. 
By default, Touch Designer creates our first operator, which is Project 1. In here, we can directly start working on the project or we move on down to another level by double-clicking on Project 1. And here we go back to where we start. We will also talk more about this later, but for now, all we need to know is that right here is where the path is. Let's move on. This button here sets the perform mode or the output of your animation if you're going to present your project with a projector or on another screen. This takes care of editing out the rest of the network editing interface and only showing the animation. Here is the palette button we already saw and in here there are ways to split and arrange the screens. Right now we're in this first mode, but if we press the second button, our screen will split into two and if we press on the paint button, we can give another roll to the right screen, like a geometry viewer, top viewer, chop viewer, and so on. To close any screens you no longer need, you can just click on the arrow here on the far right and choose other layouts up here. If we click here on wiki, we land on the official Touch Designer documentation, and next to it, it's an online forum and Touch Designer tutorials. Here we can see the frame rate again. Now, unlike the frame rate in the bottom, this here shows us the rate with which our computer is running on, which is linked to the refresh rate of your display. So this is the desired FPS and this is the actual FPS. Let's move on to the real-time flag. By default, this is active and when it is active, Touch Designer will always prioritize real-world time. Sometimes this means that for your computer to be able to handle the computing power of some complex networks, Touch Designer will drop frames. This is the mode used for most real-time installations and performance work. When the real-time flag is off, however, Touch Designer will prioritize frame rendering over real-world time, meaning the program will take as long as it's needed to process and render each frame. This, on the other hand, is useful when exporting animations or 3D renderings, and it's the mode we use whenever we render the animations we need for YouTube tutorials. Okay, let's move on. Whenever we press the Tab key, our operator window will open. Each color here represents one of the six operator families. In the next part of the tutorial, we're going to go through them and how they work. Now that we already saw the interface, we're gonna move on with the Touch Designer operator families. Touch Designer is a node-based environment. That means we create nodes, which are our operators, and these operators can only do two things. They can generate data or they can transform or manipulate this data. However, there are some operators that can do both, depending on the inputs. Let's move on with the first operator family. Here, we're gonna get acquainted with the concept of tops. If we press tab, we open our operator window. Here we see all violet colored operators are our tops. Top stands for texture operators. What does that actually mean? To better illustrate, let's create a constant top. Each node, regardless if it's a top, a chop, or any of the other operators, has a parameter window that can be opened if we press the P key. These are parameters that we can control, like the color, for example. For every node, there are going to be different parameters, but the common tab in here applies for almost all nodes here in Touch Designer. Now, when we're dealing with tops, we are dealing with a matrix of pixels. A pixel is a tiny square of color and lots of these pixels together can form a digital image. Each pixel contains R, G, B and A data, the three red, green and blue values that specify the color and an alpha channel number that specifies the transparency of that particular pixel. Here in the parameter window, we also see a resolution value, which refers to the total number of count of pixels in a digital image. To better understand the tops, I'm going to change the resolution to one by one. This is going to reduce the number of pixels to just one. I'm going to click here on the viewer active flag, and don't worry about this now, we'll also explain this later. And if I right click, this window will open. Let's select your display pixel values. And here we can see our RGBA values. If I change the resolution to two, we are going to have two pixels. And now the RGBA values stand for each of the pixels. Now it is important that we understand what the operators of each family are made out of to better understand the transformations we do on each of our nodes later on. Why is it important that we do this? If you don't really understand what is happening, then you can still watch a step-by-step -step tutorial and be able to replicate it. But if you really understand what is going on, then you can improvise yourself. Or you can take an animation you see, and without any help, you can visualize one or several ways to do it and just do it. 
And this is our goal with this tutorial. So all we have to remember for now is that our tops are made out of pixels and every pixel has an RGBA value. Now that we understand that, we can put it to use. I'm going to delete this and let's press tab and we're going to concentrate on three tops first. We're going to add a circle, a ramp and a composite. The circle and the ramp are operators that generate data, while the comp does not work unless you give it an input. The first naive approach that we could try would be if we connect the circle and the ramp to the comp and get this 3D looking sphere. Press the P key and we see here in the parameter window of the circle, we can change the radius. If I click on radius and hold it, I can move it vertically to set the scale of the change I want to make. And if I move the mouse horizontally, I can increase or decrease the value according to the scale. This saves us scrolling time. Otherwise, we also have all these other parameters. Uh, we can change the color or the opacity, change the border width, transform it into a polygon, decrease or increase the sides number to create different shapes and so on. And here we also have the common tab with the resolution and such, which will come in handy later. Let's move on to the ramp. The ramp is a color gradient, which in simpler words is only a gradual blending from one color to the other. Only that in the ramp, the number of colors we can choose is not only limited to two. So here in the parameter window, we can just click on the ramp slider as many times as we want to create a new color change and the ramp is going to interpolate between these colors. In order to delete a point you created, just click on it and drag it upwards. I'm going to delete them all for now and we'll see the usual process from the beginning. By default, there's going to be a point here at the end because it makes sense that we want to use the ramp for at least two colors. And also, the selected point will be white to begin with. And we can change the saturation of this color, which will change the gradient of this point. But we can also click here in the beginning and right now this will be the selected point. We can choose a color, increase the value and also the saturation. And this will be our ramp between green and red. We also have different types of ramp. We can choose between vertical, horizontal, circular. With a face, we can decide where the beginning of our ramp will be. With the extends right or left parameter, we can determine what happens at the edges of the ramp. Let's put the type back to vertical and if we change the face here, we can see that our ramp offsets again according to the value of the face. And if we set the extend left value to mirror, then it will do exactly that and mirror the ramp. So we see there are endless possibilities of ramp variations. We already explored the parameters of the circle and the parameters of the ramp, but what can we do with the composite top? The composite top is a multi-input top that will perform an operation for each input. Down here we have the order of the operators. Because the operation is set to multiply, changing the order of the inputs will not cause any changes in the output. If we choose, let's say, another operator, it will create a circle over the ramp. Whereas if we change the order, then the circle will disappear, because we're putting the ramp over the circle. Now if you're asking yourself what this checkered space back here is, this is caused by our alpha being zero, meaning there is no pixel data here in the background. And since there are no alpha pixels here, this area also gets ignored when we composite the circle over the ramp. Hopefully with this illustration we get some introduction into how we can create nodes that generate data and how we can combine these nodes to create other nodes. Let me split the screen and we're going to put this screen to top viewer. We can drag this line here to make the workspace pane bigger. Now if you right click here on the output of a node, our operator window will appear again and if we choose an operator it will automatically connect to the node we clicked on. Let's create here an out top. If we click on this little circle here, which is the display flag, it will show on the screen right here. So the top view will display all the nodes which have the display flag on. We can also have our nodes displayed on the background of our workspace if we right click on the empty space, go to the display and select backdrop tops. But I find it's better to have it separated in order to have a better view. If I turn on the display flag on, on several nodes, they will also appear on the top viewer like this. This would be useful if we want to monitor the changes on several nodes at the same time. The out here, if I scroll out, what it creates, we can see here that our project has some kind of output and this is the out top we just created. If we select all three of our nodes, we can copy them and paste them underneath. And let's say here in the ramps, I select the second point and put it green. Select the first point and put it blue and we'll add an extra point here in between and set it to yellow. 
and now in the call if operation instead of over I'll put it to multiply and we'll get this note. What we can do next is press tab and create another composite and have our two original composites as inputs and have ourselves a little composite inception. Now in here we only see the second composite displayed. Why is this again? because the operation is set to multiply. What does multiply mean in this instance? We have no alpha values in the second comp, meaning zero, and we're trying to multiply this with the alpha values of the first comp, which gives us zero. But what we can do is set the operation again to over. So we have our comp two over our comp one. Let's change the color of our second comp, and this is what we get. If we get the output of this comp, drag it close to the connection here, and let go once it turns yellow, this will replace our original connection. And here in the top viewer, we see our COMP3 displayed. Congratulations, you just created your first network with only three components. To ensure that this information really synced in, we're going to have a little assignment. This is our assignment. I created this output by using only the circle, the ramp and the composite operator. Try to think about how this was created and maybe you can think of ways how you could replicate it yourself by only using our three operators. A little hint is the operation of the composite. A good practice is if you stop the video now and try to think about this yourself and when you're ready come back for the solution. Okay, if you took the time to think about it and came back with the solution, it's great. Keep watching to see the result. If you couldn't think of anything, then also don't worry, we can keep trying and we'll get better with time. Promise. Here I have my top viewer activated. And in the network path, we can see project one slash assignment one. That means I created here a folder and if I click on it, we can see the solution. So first we create these circles with different colors, all of them connected to a composite. And in the composite, the operation is set to average, causing the circles to overlap. Then we add a ramp, we connect the comp1 and the ramp to a second comp, and we set here the operation to over. We connect the second comp to a null top, and that was it. Now, the null doesn't really do anything, it has no effect on the image, it's just used as a good practice to close a network. And that was it for the assignment. Now I'm going to go back to the original project. I'm going to delete the assignment and we'll keep going where we left off. We're going to introduce now three new operators. The lookup, the edge and the transform. These are all data transforming nodes. The lookup allows us to change colors. So let's say we already set the colors of the ramp, but we would like to have a general control on the control scheme of the whole output. And this we can do with a lookup. The lookup replaces color values in our top image connected to its first input so in this case our comp3, with values coming from a ramp we're going to connect to its second input. Now here there are no changes yet because we have to set the colors in our ramp which are now only going from black to white. Once we do this, we can see the changes in the whole image. So we only need to connect the lookup to our out and there we have it. This is very commonly used our lookup, the image whose colors we would like to change in the first input, and the ramp in the second input. Okay, on to our next operator, the edge. If we connect the edge to the lookup and we zoom in, we see that we lose the color and the area of the circle and are only left with the circumference, or the edge. If you notice that the resolution is not the best, don't worry, we'll fix it later, but first let's concentrate on building stuff. We saw up to now we can add a new operator by pressing tab or right clicking on the output of a node. But we can also right click on a connecting line between two nodes and add an operator that will be automatically connected to the previous and next operator. Let's add another composite in here. As we see, we have been using the composite many times, so it is a very useful operator. If we go ahead and connect the edge operator to our new comp, everything about our image gets messed up and we only see an empty circle with some color to it. That, again, is because the operation of our composite is set to multiply. Let's set the operation to over and set the edge to be over the lookup. And here we can distinguish our edge. 
Some of you who might have already more experience may be asking yourselves, couldn't we have done this with the border color of the circle? And the answer is yes, but we're not always going to be working with circles or clean shapes in Dutch Designer. Sometimes we will import irregular shapes into our files, like a banana or a cat that we cannot simply cut out the inner pixels. And this is why it's important to make use of the edge operator. Now let's drag the transform operator down here. The transform operator applies 2D transformations to our top image. So if we connect it to the edge and the comp4 and press P, here in the parameter window we can scale it up for example and have this ring. If we want to have two rings then what we can do is copy the transform and in the transform we can scale down the original ring. Let's connect the second transform to the composite and in here we'll change the order of the second transform to be over the lookup. And here we have our two rings and we can keep making changes if necessary. In the transform here there's also another cool feature. To illustrate it I'll copy a third transform and plug it directly into the out. And here in the parameter window we can translate the circle and it might cut out of the frame so if you don't want this you only need to scale it down first. We can also rotate, but right now we have a circle, so we wouldn't notice any impressive changes. The point is that you can plug this transform into any operator, so if we were to plug it in the composite from up here, we can then make changes to this comp specifically. We can also right click on the connecting line and disconnect the operators, and also press backspace to delete the operator entirely. Let's connect everything again to how it was in the beginning. Now if we want to increase the quality of our image, we concentrate on our generators, which are right here. While holding down shift, we can select all our generators and in the parameter window here on common, if you remember, we said these parameters apply to almost all our operators. In here, we can just go to the resolution and set the highest resolution. And now everything from the circle to the colors will be of better quality. Now that we learned a little bit more about the lookup, the edge and the transform, we can move on to a second assignment. This is the second assignment. If you want to pause the video now, go get yourself some coffee or some fresh air and try to think about how this image could have been done. Once you come back, you can try to replicate it on Touch Designer and then we can compare our solutions. Ok, I'm gonna click on the assignment here to see the solution. So first we create two circles, one of them grey, the other white. With the second one I decrease the radius and set the center to a little bit more to the left. Then we apply an edge operator to get the border and afterwards we add two transforms. In the first one we translate the edge in the x direction where it cuts the left part and in the second transform we we'll scale up what's left of the edge and move it to the right. You later see that what we did in the first transform we could have also done with a crop operator. But the point of this assignment is to really learn what is possible with each operator. Next we composite the transform in the first comp with an add operation. We then connect the composite to the first input of a lookup and connect a ramp to the second input. In the ramp I only selected one shade of blue. The reason why we see here in the image two different shades of blue is because the lookup maps the bright colors to the gradient on the right and the dark colors to the gradient on the left. This means if we would have put this circle completely black it would disappear after the lookup but if we put the color to lighter it will slowly go closer and closer to the color of the other circle all mapping accordingly to the range in the ramp. Ok, now let's go back to the initial project, get rid of the assignment and we'll introduce two new operators. We'll introduce the noise, which is a data generating operator and also the displace, a transformative generator. These two operators go very well together. The noise generator, we use it all the time in our animations and tutorials and you'll probably also use it often. What it does is it generates noise data, which is not completely random, as it would look like if we would put the type to completely random. The difference between the random noise here and the other types of noise 
is that the random noise is, as the name suggests, always very random, meaning the values may vary from each other drastically, making it look quite messy, whereas the other noises look more organic, since the values are only pseudo-random, meaning each value gets chosen randomly, but inside a specific range, in accordance with the value that was chosen before. A little trick here is if we create here a second noise and connect the first onto the second input of the second one, we achieve this very nice looking noise. But more on the noise later. Our displays operator accepts two inputs. The first one is for the source image and the second one is for the displays image. So let's have a look. Let's attach the comp to the first input of the displays and the noise to the second input. Let's connect the displays to the out and here we see complete madness. This is nothing like we had before and this happens because the displays weight by default is always set to 1. I've personally never used it so high, so what I always do is I go to 0 and then I gradually go up. So you see this more organic look on the displacement and we can play around until it gets completely destroyed. So on one, the displacement is really drastic. So we leave it on a lower value for the beginning. Now let's go back to the noise and see what we can do here. Increasing the period of the noise stretches the noise pattern out. And if we put the period on zero, the borders start to partially get deconstructed. And in the monochrome here, we can toggle between color and monochrome noise. So this option gives color to the noise. Meaning when the noise is monochrome, the displacement will move diagonally like this from zero to one. And when the monochrome is off, the displacement will happen all over like this. So what we need to remember here is we can give color to the noise to get a more uniform displacement. Here we also notice that the displace weight happens in both x and y directions. So if we put for instance the y value to 0, we notice that the displacement is only happening in the x direction. And the same would happen with the other way around. Okay, now we have two more tools in our toolkit and we can here play around with the values and understand more what each of them causes. Now for the next assignment, we're going to do something with all the nodes we learned up to now. This is the assignment. Try to understand what is going on here. Which shapes have been used to create this image only using the nodes we saw before? Pause the video now and try to recreate this on your own. Okay, let's see the solution. First we have here one circle and in the parameter window we have the polygon switch to on. Number of sides to 3, rotate 90 degrees so it's in this position and we have duplicated this only with a different rotation. Then we compose item with an over, we attach a displace and we displace it with a noise. We scale it up with a transform and change the color with a lookup. Then we use a composite with an over operation to put the comp one over the lookup. So here we can understand that different combinations between the same nodes can create endless new visuals. Let's do a quick review of what we have up to now. We have circle tops to create different geometrical shapes like circles, triangles, hexagons and so on. To create operations with our inputs we use our composite tops. We use the edge operator to get the outline of every shape. We use the lookup operator which together with the ramp allows us to change the color of an image. We create gradients of colors with ramps and we use the displace operator which in combination with the noise operator helps us achieve a more organic look on our visuals. Now let's quickly go through some other operators that might be useful, but we're not going to go too much in depth with this one. First, let's see the level top. Here we can set the brightness and the contrast. We can invert the colors, we can play with the gamma, and in the post-processing the values can also be useful. Another operator is the HSV adjust. Here we have values like uh, hue offset value, saturation, the hue range, and yes, this might also be useful for very different visuals. We briefly talked about the crop before, so let's also see the crop. This operator lets us crop off a part of an image, while with the tile operator we can get copies of the image. An important top operator we haven't seen yet is the movie file in, which allows us to add custom files like images and videos like this random banana for example which comes by default and we can apply all transformations to these files also so actually if we move this file all the way to the beginning here 
then we would have some weird banana shapes here laying around and getting transformed all the way through our network. We can also put here all type of assets and that's why this could be very useful. By the way, once we added the tiles here, we can now also crop the tiles. Let's have a look at the mirror operator next. Here we can rotate the mirror or flip it along whichever x or y axis. And the mirror goes also very well with a tile. For instance, once I have a tile and a mirror, I could just add another tile and it would give us this cool kaleidoscopic effect. If we wanted to, we could also flip the tiles here and we would get a nice psychedelic effect. Let's also have a look at the cross operator. This has two inputs and if we connect this crop to its second input, then we could cross here between the two images, with one being the first image and zero the second. And everything in between, just a blend between the two images. We can also add a switch and here we can have different inputs. So if I connect it to the tile, the cross and let's see the displays and we connect its outputs to the out, we have 0, 1 and 2 assigned to these inputs and once we turn on blend between inputs we can just move the sliders to blend from one input to the next and we can have as many inputs as we want. This is very useful for creating visuals that change over time. Okay, if we delete this part of the network, then right here we have all the basics of our top operators. Up to this part of the tutorial, we have seen static things only. To get things moving, we could use easy Python programming language expressions, or we could use the chop family. And the chop operators are the next operators we are going to learn. <music> the chop family. Here we see we have several operators that have something to do with audio, MIDI signals, OCCs, and these are all protocols to connect to other applications or get data from elsewhere into Touch Designer. Let's start with a basic operator, RLFGoff. The difference between this operator and the texture operators we saw until now is that the chop operators are channel based and the channels themselves are sample based. If we press the space bar to stop the LFO, this would be a good example of an operator where we have one channel and one sample. Now let's add a pattern here to see our other variation of a chop, which has a channel with multiple samples. The question here is what can we do with this data? We can use this data to drive other parameters in Touch Designer. Let's see on an example. We're going to move this LFO closer to our network and let's say we want to animate the period parameter or any other parameter for that matter. Then all we need to do is we turn on the top viewer flag on the LFO. Once we do this, this little arrow appears whenever the mouth is on top of the knob. So when it appears, we can click on the LFO and drag it on top of the noise and when the parameter window appears, we drop it onto the parameter we want animated. In this case, it's the period. And then we select chop reference. So now the LFO value is driving the period of the noise. While the LFO here is going until minus 1, the minimum value of the period is 0. This causes the animation to look unnatural. One way to fix this is by changing the type of LFO in the parameter window to Gaussian instead of sine. This has values going from 0 to 1. To lower the speed of the animation, we have to set the frequency of the LFO to lower, and we can do this manually. So if I put it to 0.01, .01, this would have the animation move way too slow. But if we put this 0.1, then this would slow down the animation, but still so that we can see the transition. Now let's say we don't want the period to go from 0 to 1, but instead from 1 to 2. To do this, let's right click on the output of the LFO and let's introduce our new chop operator, the math. The math operator allows us to do mathematical operations between inputs if given multiple inputs, or it can also help us remap the range of our input. So we see here the frame range is set from 0 to 1, and we're going to set the two range from 1 to 2. Here we see that nothing is happening, and this happens because we map the value of the LFO to the noise, so the math is not really receiving any input anymore. This scenario is a perfect opportunity for us to learn why it's always important to close a network with a null. So instead of mapping the math to the noise and having to remap each new operator we add, we just add a null at the end of the chain. And we can put this viewer active and drag and drop it to the period of the noise. 
Now we have control over the whole chain through this node and we can add other operators without having to change the reference. Here we can still change the parameters of the LFO and since the LFO is connected to the node, the changes will still be reflected on the animation. Now the same type of animation we did here, we can do with the parameters of the other operators we have. So let's say in the level we want to change the invert, which goes from 0 to 1. So what we'll do first is we're going to copy this node, and here it's good practice to rename the different nodes, so our network is more readable. So let's rename this to noise period. Now once I hit enter it's going to crash and we're going to get an error warning that none type object is not subscriptable. This is a weird error that has an explanation and an easy fix. If we go to the noise period there is a python expression here that we're not going to go through now but what is important is that our null one was referenced here before. And since we renamed it our null one doesn't exist anymore like it used to. So we just put our noise period here we were active and remap it to the period. So every time we change the name, we would have to remap the null. Let's rename the null2 to, to invert, which is the parameter we want to remap. We're not going to get an error here though, since there is nowhere yet where we have mapped this null. Because the invert here is connected to the mat, the range is going from 1 to 2, but we want it to go from 0 to 1. And since our LFO was also going from 0 to 1, we're going to instead connect the LFO to the invert and the range is going to be right. Now let's put the invert viewer active. Alternatively to pressing the viewer active flag, we could also press A on the keyboard to switch the node to viewer active and back. Once we do this, we drag our invert and we hover it on top of the level, seeing how it holds the parameter we want to animate. We drop it on top of the invert and select chop reference. So here on the right screen, we can now see the invert also being animated. So now we're starting to understand what we can do with these operators. But what about the pattern? This pattern, what it is, is actually just an animated version of the LFO. So if we go to the parameter window, we see that the length here, which is the amount of samples, is set by default to 1000. If we decrease the value to 1, then our pattern is just the same as our LFO. And if we change the phase here, it will also move the same as the phase of the LFO. Let's bring the length back to 100 and the phase back to 0. And here we can choose different waves for our pattern, between the sine and cosine, we can choose the ram, the square, random, step wave, and so on. The question is how can we use the pattern to control our visuals? Let's see on an example. Since we put the type to step here, the pattern is going to be 0 for the first 50 samples, and then it goes to 1 for the next 50 samples. Or another way we could interpret this is as off while in 0, and then on while in 1. Then we can have this pattern drive one of the parameters here in the HSV adjust. Let's say we want the hue offset to be 0 and 50, or better 10 and 50. So we're going to map the hue value of 10 for this first period of time and 50 for this period of time. Right now the value is static, meaning it can only have either one of these two values, so either 50 or 10. So we need an operator here to give us a sample number at any given time. We can do this with a beat chop. Let's set here the period to 20, and we're also going to add a lookup operator. The lookup chop is now maybe a little hard to imagine, but has the same concept as the lookup top. Meaning if we put here the beat as the first input, then the beat is going to give us the index going from 0 to 1. This interval here actually doesn't always have to be from 0 to 1, it can also be from 3 to 20 or some other values. What's important is that the beat range has to be the same as the range of the lookup. We then connect the pattern to the second input of the lookup. The lookup is going to traverse this pattern. So imagine what is happening right now is that the beat is telling the lookup, hey, I'm at position 0, go to the pattern and tell me the value of the pattern at the 0th position. Hopefully that's understandable, but then we run into the problem that we didn't want the values to be 0 and 1, we wanted them to be 50 and 10. So let's right click here and add a math chop, which will allow us to change the range. So the from range goes from 0 to 1 and we want it to go from 50 to 10. And then for good practice we're going to add a null and rename it to hue offset. Now let's press the viewer active flag on the hue offset and drag and drop it onto the hue offset parameter of the HSV adjust. So there we have it. The hue is 50 while this is 1 and the hue of 10 while it's 0. 
This was just a silly example to demonstrate the pattern. If we put here the type to sign, then the hue is constantly rather than drastically changing between 50 and 10, because the sign pattern also doesn't jump from one value to another, but it rather flows. So what we take away from this demonstration is that we can have a bit give us the index data, and then we can have a pattern for our index data to traverse through. So imagine what is happening right now is that as the bit is increasing, it is traversing through our sign function and giving us the values until the end, and then starting again. So now we learn two ways, one with the telephone and one with the bit and the pattern to manipulate our visual sense animations. So now we have some basics of chops and we want to test this knowledge with a new assignment. <laughs> This is the animation for our new assignment. Try to understand what is going on here, which values are being changed. Think about this, pause the video and try to recreate it, then come back for the solution. Ok, so let's see how this was done. Down here we have a basic top network. First we have a circle and a ramp, both connected to a composite. The color changing is due to the ramp here. In the parameter window, we set the face to minus 0.5 and the extent left is set to repeat, which causes this abrupt change between the gradients right in the middle of the image. When the extent left is set to repeat, it means the whole spectrum here it keeps repeating. And since the face is set to start at minus 0.5, then this right here is the area where we are. Then we have a ramp for the background and we're compositing everything with a circle over the ramp. And then we close the network with a null. Then up here we have an LFO with the frequency set to 0.1. Here we have a mat with the range going from minus 1 to 1, since the type of our LFO is a signed function also going from minus 1 to 1. The 2 range here is a value that I found through trial and error. If we were to put here a value higher than 0.3 or lower than minus 0.3, then the circle would move out of the frame. And this is how I came up with these values. And then we're also closing the network with a null and we attach this null to the center of the circle after putting it viewer active. And that was it. If you managed to recreate this, then congratulations. And if not, don't worry. The more examples you see and the more you practice, the better you're going to get with time. Now let's go back to our learning project. We have here one image output and let's say we want to add another image and have the two images cross between each other. So for example, I'm going to press tab and add a movie file in top, our banana. We're going to first set the output resolution to custom and choose the highest resolution. So let's make this a little more interesting. We're going to add a tile then repeat and flip all of them. Then we can add the displays. So we're going to displace our bananas. How are we going to do this? With the HSD adjust in the second input. Let's put the weight here slightly lower. We don't actually really care how it looks like now, we just need another input to illustrate the cross. Let's add a quick transform here and choose some other color for the background. We're going to set the alpha to 1 and turn on comp of our background color. This will always give us a colored background. Now let's add a cross down here and the first animation is already connected. So we're also going to connect our banana and let's find out how we can animate this crossing from one image to the other. So here we have the timeline and in the middle of the whole animation we want to have the cross. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to create a timeline chop and also a pattern chop. In the pattern we'll set the type to ramp. The ramp function here in the pattern chop is going to give us a smooth transition between the images, which is what we want. Now let's add a lookup and in the first input it's going to receive an index. So let's connect the timeline operator. And the table of values, the pattern, is going into the second input. We see now that nothing is happening. Why is this? Here in the lookup we see that the index range goes from 0 to 1, while our timeline goes from 1 to 600. So we just need to manually set it here from 1 to 600 and there we have the movement. Here we know that we're going to reference this lookup to animate our cross, so we need to close the network by adding a null. Let's rename the null to cross index. Then we're going to click on the cross. On the cross index we're going to turn on the viewer active flag and we're going to drag and drop it onto the cross. 
So now we see the animation we want through the timeline, which is possible through this growing pattern. But in some cases, this smooth animation might not be what we want. If we set the type to step, for instance, then we would have an abrupt change. So as soon as we are in the middle of the timeline, our bananas will appear all of a sudden. So let's say we still want to have this type of animation, but we want instead the first picture to stay only until the 300th frame, and then the next image to appear smoothly. How do we do that? By adding a lag chop here in between. The lag slows down rapid changes in the input channel. And then in the parameter window we can play around with the lag values and see the changes in the 300th frame. If for any reason we want to skip this effect, then we can bypass it with this little arrow button in here. And the bypass option applies for every other node in the network. For example, the displays here, or the HSV adjust, and so on for every other operator. For a similar, less abrupt effect than the lag, we have the filter chop. The filter chop smooths or sharpens the input channels. We can do this with the filter width parameter. Maybe in this scenario the filter chop is a more adequate solution, but knowing that the lag exists is important for using in other scenarios. Ok, now that we were introduced to the cross chop, let's move on to the next assignment. This is our fifth assignment, done with the chops we just saw. Try to understand what is going on here, how can this motion be achieved, then pause the video, try to recreate it and then come back for the solution. Now let's see the solution. Don't get intimidated by the amount of nodes. Every row is just a copy of the first row with different values. How this is done is by creating first all five circle tops. Then we create the patterns, all with a sign type, and only the phases are different. So 0, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, and 0 0.8. Then we add a timeline chop and a lookup for every pattern, where the timeline is the index input and the respective pattern is the second input. And we set the index range manually to 1 to 600, same as the timeline. Then we have 5 math nodes to limit the movement of the circle only inside our area by changing the two range to minus 0.3 to 0.3, as we discussed before. A tip here to save time is by holding shift we can select all the math nodes and change the range at the same time. For example, if we want to put it to 0.2, then we can do this simultaneously. This will decrease the width of movement for all circles at the same time. We then close all networks with the nodes and map them individually to the center of each circle in the parameter window. To put all circles in the same screen, we composite them all with an add operation. We composite them again with a ramp and a multiply operation for the circles to get the gradient of the ramp. We then add a lookup top to change the colors through another ramp and then we close the network. And that's it, that's the solution. We here have an overview of the chops we learned. For the next part, in case you have been wondering how I've made these tiny containers, they're done with a comp operator family. Comps are unique compared to other operator families in that they contain their own networks. To make a new network in our project, we create a new component using the create menu and selecting a base. We're going to go into more detail about the comps later, but let's first quickly see how we can create our own components. We created this base here, let's name it subtutorial, and we're going to use this base later to explain the subfamily. Now if we go in, then we're in project1 slash subtutorial. If we scroll back, then we're back out. As of now, this node doesn't have an output or an input either. So let's go back in and let's create here a movie file in and attach it to a node. And if we scroll out, we can see now we have here a node that wasn't there before. And now we can attach our node to a node top. I did this to illustrate that with the comps you can create your own components like this and have them connect with other operators. So let's say we want this component to have an input right here. Let's first go in. We add here a constant and a composite. And we say instead of multiply, we say over. This will give us a white background. Ok, so now if we scroll out again and delete the assignment path and let's say we want to pass this animation as the background of the banana. As of now we cannot do that because there is no input. So we have to give an input to the node. To 
to do that, we can attach an in operator here. The in top is used to create a top input in a component. So what we can do right now is we can get just any of these composites and connect them to the input we just created. And there we go. We have a new background that goes automatically into the new in. This was just a short example on how we can create new comps. Let's disconnect this now, go back in, let's delete the network, and for now we'll close the second screen. So up to now we've seen our texture operators made out of pixel data, we saw our chops made out of channel data that contains samples, and next we're introducing the SOPs or surface operators that can generate, import, modify or combine 3D surfaces or geometries. So let's add our first operators. I'm gonna add a box, a 3D rectangle whose Z component is zero. Uh, let's add a sphere and a super quad. If we zoom in, we can click and then drag to rotate into different directions. With a scroll, we can move closer or further away from the box. And if for some reason we move far away or in a weird position, we can just press H in the keyboard and go back to the home state. If we right click on the node, we can select the camera modes. And if we click on the display options, in here we can see a lot of information, but interesting for us to know right now are the points and the normals of the points, which are directional vectors perpendicular to the side of the geometry connected to the current point. What can we do with these operators? We can use them to create 3D visuals. So let's say we want to have two boxes that move inside a three-dimensional space. So let's just copy the original box and we're going to introduce the merge operator. The merge sop merges geometry from multiple sops. So let's connect both our boxes to the merge and we still only see one box here. The reason for this is that both our boxes are of the same size and the exact same position. So let's fix this by adding a transform sop here, similar to the transform top. And we can change the translation, the rotation and the scale. Let's move the second box in the x-axis and now we have two boxes and we can start building a 3D scene. Let's put our chop knowledge to good use here and we're going to animate. Let's say we want to move our two boxes up and down. For this, we need another transform here in order to reference to the movement later. Now let's press tab and if we hold shift and click twice on the LFO, we can create two LFO chops at the same time. We're gonna select them both and change the frequency to 0.1. Next, let's attach a node to both LFOs and we're going to use the nodes to animate the movement of each box up and down along the y-axis. So put the first node you were active and drag and drop it onto the translate y parameter of the first box. So now we see our box is moving along the y-axis. Now let's repeat for the next box. In the other case that we want to animate the rotation, we can still use the same LFOs but we will run into the problem that the range of the rotation is moving from 0 to 360 degrees. To overcome this, we add two maths. Connect each math to the respective LFO, and we're gonna set the from range minus one to one and the to range zero to 360. You can do this actually in the same time by selecting both maths with shift and spare yourself the time, unlike what I did. Connect each math node to a null and to better view this, let's split the screen, set the second screen to Geometry Viewer, and on the Merge node, turn on the Display flag. Now we see our boxes on the big screen. Here we see in the parameter window we can change the value of the rotation in the Y direction and the box will rotate. For this to happen automatically, we will drag and drop our node 3 to the rotate parameter of the first box, and the node 4 to the Y rotate parameter of the second box. Now if we put a null after each of the box nodes, we can switch between the shapes. So all we need to do is connect a sphere, for example, to the null, and now all our transformations will apply to the sphere. We can change here the radius to better recognize the rotation, and there we have a rotating sphere moving up and down the y-axis. What else can we do here? Without adding any extra nodes, we can change and play around with the parameters of the shapes and see what they can do. 
Something else we can do here is add a noise sock. The noise in the sock world is very cool because it creates this kind of morphing of the shape. Let's go higher with the radius to demonstrate and we can also change the parameters of the noise itself to get endless possibilities, like with the period, the amplitude and so on. But at the end of the day, the output of Touch Designer is going to be a, an image or a video. And what we have right now is only a 3D representation. So then how can we convert this into an image? What do we need to convert it into? If you guessed tops, then you're absolutely right. Let's bypass the noise for a moment and connect the box back to the null. To convert the two animated boxes into tops, we are going to add a camera comp, which is a 3D object that acts like real world cameras. Then we're going to add a light comp, which is an object that casts light into a 3D scene. Later on, we're going to connect the whole thing to a render to convert the scene to tops. Touch Designer lets us connect the sops to a render only if the sop is connected to geometry first. Now, to add a geometry, it's important that we right click on the output of the merge and attach it like this. If we instead press tab and add the geometry like so, it would come without an input. We could just scroll in, delete the geo and add an in operator like we saw before with the comps, but this is just extra work that can be spared by just right clicking here. So the setup that we have right here is going to help us take a picture or a video of our boxes in a pixel format transforming it into tops. So the camera, in combination with the geometry and the lights, converts this into an image. So now let's add the render operator from the tops world. The render can render all 3D objects if connected to a camera, lights and a geometry. If you notice here in the render node, we only see one box though. Why is this? This happens because the camera, if we zoom in, is positioned here and it's only looking at the one box. We need to treat the camera like a real-life camera. So first we move it in the x-axis, so the camera is positioned somewhere in between of both boxes. And to move the camera further away from the boxes, we increase the translate in the y-axis. And there we see in the render both boxes. Let's click on the render top and in the parameter window we go to common and set the resolution to a squared resolution. Now remember we are still inside a comp with no output, so let's add an out top and then we're going to scroll out and we can integrate this custom composition we just created in the network we had before. So we can have the boxes in the cross with the other image input like this. Let's go back to the SOP. Let's set the mode in the other screen to top viewer and turn the render flag on on the out top. Just for visual purposes, I'll add here a lookup and a ramp to have some color. So now that we have learned how to create 3D geometry, how to transform it, how to morph it, let's introduce the twist sop right here. With the help of the twist, we can deform the shape like we see here in the second box. If we want to apply this effect on both our boxes, then we only need to delete it from here and attach it after the merge, where it influences both shapes. We just increase the strength and there we go. Now that you are familiar with the SOPs, let's move on to the new assignment. This is the new assignment. In order to achieve this, you would need SOPs, TOPs and CHOPs. First, try to understand what is happening here with the shapes and the movement, and then try to recreate the animation yourself. Then come back to compare the solutions. Ok, let's see the solution. First we have a sphere and a twist. The twist operator is twisting around the y-axis and the strength is going back and forth. The sphere has a lot of detail, 100 by 100, and the radius in the x-direction is smaller than the other directions. Then we have an LFO with a sign type and frequency of 0.1. Then we have a math to rearrange the range of the LFO from minus 1 to 1 to 0 to 360 degrees of the twisting. We close the network with a null and map the values to the strength of the twist. We then have a geometry and we map the same null also to the y rotation of the geometry. And this gives us the twisting and rotating at the same time. 
we have a camera and lights for the render and here we multiply the render with a RAM. I changed here in the render the resolution and it is to the same resolution of the RAM, 1024 by 1024. If we have here a lower resolution, like for example 265 by 265, then the render will not look as nice. Then we got the ramp and the sphere in a composite to get the colored sphere. We then add an edge to get the borders and parallel we also have a level, which inverts completely the ramp from before. And then we have a composite with a comp1 over the level. Then we composite again the edge over the comp2 and close the network with a knob. And that's it. I hope you are now understanding how you can mix tops and chops, then pass them to a render and then work with tops. Okay, now let's scroll out and if you notice here we're in project 1 slash subtutorial. And here we're in project 1 subtutorial assignment. And so we see that it's working like a directory. So if I scroll out, I go back to the sub-tutorial and the beginning of the network. So what I want to do now is create here another directory for the second sub-tutorial. So I'm going to copy the name and paste it here. And Touch Designer will automatically append a 1 to the name because the name of the bases have to be unique. Now let's go into the second tutorial and for the moment we're going to close the second screen. One operator that we didn't explore before was the super quad that may seem like a sphere now but if we change these two parameters here we can create these very cool shapes that cannot be done with just the sphere soft. Next we have the torus. Let's put here the orientation and the z-axis in order to see better. This sub is shaped like a donut and here we can change the radius. And then we also have the grid sop, which can be a starting point for many projects. One trick here is if we connect a noise sop to it, this will give us a noisy plane, which now looks a little flat and the reason for this is because the normals are not calculating. Remember we talked about the normals before. If we right click here on the shape, go to display options and select the normals, we see they are all facing towards the camera. To fix this we can right click here to add an attribute create sop and in the parameter window we can compute the normals and the tangents. Then we see here that the reflections are being calculated. So if we right click here again, go to display options, normals, then we see here that the normals are now moving more naturally. So the attribute create sop is useful when you want to create more detail. And sometimes you even get a warning from Touch Designer if you don't have it. Okay, now let's get rid of this for now. And let's put the orientation of the grid in the ZX plane to make it look like a floor. Let's then create a sphere and a tube. Make the tube longer. And what we're going to do is put the two shapes on top of the grid. And then we're going to slowly animate them and then we're gonna render. Let's create a transform for all our shapes except for the grid and we're going to attach all shapes to the respective transform. Let's create a merge operator and in the merge operator if you click on one of the operators you want to connect to the merge and then press shift and select also all the other operators then you can connect them all at the same time. Let's split the screen again and put it to Geometry Viewer. Right now we don't see anything yet because the display flag on the merge operator is still off. So let's go ahead and turn that on and here we get all of our shapes in a mess since they're all in the exact same position. So let's first go to the grid and increase the size of the grid. Next we're going to click on the torus and here we're going to put the orientation in the y-axis and we're going to also move the center up along the y-axis. But since we added a transform here for every shape it would be easier for us to set the changes here. So let's delete the parameters and translate the torus up along the y-axis. Let's also move the tube in the same way. Maybe also increase the height a bit more. Let's then move the sphere up, maybe on top of the tube. 
and then we can decrease the second radius of the tube to make it look a bit more like a cone and we're not concentrating now on making this look pleasant we just want to see what's possible let's make the super quad also bigger and there we go so now we already know what is possible to do with the merge operator and what we could also do here after the transform for example we, we could add a noise operator and have the top of our tower moving like this and yes once you understand what you can do then you can be creative here now let's render it we remember how we're gonna right click on the out here to add the geometry next we're going to add a camera and the lights We're going to connect all these to a render top and lastly we're going to connect the render to the out now if we go here to the paint type and select the top viewer mode we don't see anything and this is because you guessed it the display flag needs to be turned on and now we see something something weird but it's still something now the reason this looks weird is if i switch back to geometry viewer and select the camera look at where our camera is we saw this before so we're just too close and we want the camera to be somewhere up here so let's say we want the camera to always be facing towards the zero zero coordinates the trick to achieve this is to create a null comp first and if we click on the camera there's a parameter here called look at and what we're going to do is drag the null we just created and drop it on top of the look at We'll see in a moment what this does, but first let's click on the select and transform here. We're going to select the camera, click here, and the handles will appear for us to move the camera. Here we notice that even if I move the camera, it stays facing towards the null. So here, let me get a little closer to demonstrate. If I were to go to the null and translate in the y direction, we see that the camera is still facing that way. This is all because of the look at reference. If we deleted the look at parameter, then the camera will stop facing towards the null. But we do want it to stay fixed and this is why we added the null. So let's click back on the handle and move the camera again also a little higher. Okay, now let's click back on the viewport here. In this mode, if I just click and drag on the screen, I can pan it. Then let's go back to the null and we're going to increase the translate Y value while seeing the render so that the camera is facing the sphere on top. And we do the whole thing with the handles and the translate value until we find the camera position to fit the whole image. Now that we have that, we notice that our scene is too dark. So let's select the lights, we're going to put the mode to geometry viewer again, and we're going to find a suitable place for the lights. You can always go back into the geometry viewer mode if you're not satisfied. And another useful setting in the camera in the parameter window, view, is the FOV angle that sets the distance of the camera to our scene without messing with the other settings. And yes, this usually requires correction, like for example, right now the grid is too small. So let's go back to the grid and we're going to increase the size. And with the lights, we can also have different results, not only the position, but also the type of light, the angle of the light and so on. But for now, let's stick to the point light. To introduce color into our shapes, there are several ways, but we can do it inside the top world with a ramp, like we saw until now, or we could use the material. There are a lot of materials here, but for now let's explore the Fong material. We will drag and drop it onto the Geo and we'll select parameter material. We don't see any changes yet, because the Fong material creates a material using the shading model, which is not on the default state. But once we change the colors, then the change will be visible. We can here also explore the other parameters and to make this look a bit more organic we could add a transform before the out, set the alpha to 1 and turn on comp over background color to set the background to black. 
So now we know the different shapes, how to merge them, we know how to use the camera and the lights, and we could also have some other rotation for the camera. And for some cases it would look nice to add an LFO to the camera and have the camera movements animated. But for now we have more than the basics, so let's move on to the last SOP assignment. to recreate this, try answering these questions. What is happening here? Which shapes could have been used? What is happening to the background? Try to analyze and recreate this yourself. Pause the video now and come back for the solution. Ok, let's see the solution. What do we have here? We have three choruses, three transforms and one merge. Each transform has an animated rotation in Z and this is driven by these three networks here. We have three patterns, all of them are ramps with different phases. We have a timeline giving us a current frame and a lookup for each with a range from 1 to 600. So the timeline is traversing the patterns and giving us this movement. After the movement we attach a geo, a camera and a light in order to render. Then we create a circular ramp with a resolution of 1024 by 1024. Same as the render and then we have a composite multiplying the render with a ramp to give the choruses this color. Then we have a copy of this ramp, only that the face here is being animated by this LFO with a frequency of 0.1. Then we're inverting the ramp completely with a level on a reduced brightness, followed by a displacement with a noise. We're compositing the choruses over our background and an out at the end. And that's it. We can still go back to the patterns and play with the amplitudes and have the rings move slower or faster or play with other parameters. If you didn't recreate the scene the first time, you could still pause the video and try to recreate it from your memory. This could also be a good way to learn and if any questions arise, you could ask them in the comments. But good news for now, we're done with the SOPs and we're going to move on to the next operator family, the DOTS. Let's have a quick recap. Until now we have learned the pixel based TOPs, the channel and sample based CHOPs, the 3D object based SOPs, we learned a little bit about the materials and now we have come to the DOTS. The dot family is based on tables, text and scripting. We will see now the text dot, the chop execute dot, the table dot and the folder dot. Let's start with the text one, which lets us edit freeform text. Here we can put it viewer active and just write whatever we want. This might be useful for a comment. So here for example we have the SOP tutorial and here we can bring the text up and write this is a SOP tutorial and help us organize stuff. But more importantly the text dot can be used for scripting, so we could write python code here and execute it. Let's see how this works. I'm going to split the screen and put here text port and dots mode and now we have here a python interpreter. And here we could write python code as easy as 2 plus 4 and it will give us 6 or we could declare a variable like a is hello and if we say print a then it will print the hello for us. Great and then here we can also drag and drop our dots and we can read it, delete it and replace it through code. Before we move on let's have a little disclaimer here. If you have no idea about programming in Python and maybe this part might be more than you want to know, you are welcome to skip to the next time step of the video. Otherwise, if you still want to learn or are just interested to see what's possible, then keep on watching. But I'm not going to explain the basics of Python, rather I will go through the basics of Python in Touch Designer. Ok, let's move on. Now in Python the most important function is the op and this is a function that is already declared in Touch Designer. And with it, we can talk to any touch designer operator. So let's create here an operator, let's say a ramp top. 
and in the parameter window here on the left of each parameter we have this plus sign and if we click on it it shows us the name of how the parameter is called in python and in this case face is the same as face but sometimes the names don't correspond so you should always check it out first now with the op we can reference any operator and we're going to reference this one called ramp4 so i'll type here ramp4 and then to access a parameter within this operator we type dot par and then another dot and then we put the name of the parameter we want to change in our case we have the face so i'll type in face and then we can put this equal to i don't know 0.4 so now we have our text here in order to execute this we can either right click and then go to run script or we can press command r in the keyboard and there we have the results and the face changed to 0.4 let's put 0.9 and then i'm gonna press command r to execute Great, so this way we control the operator without doing it in the parameter window. Let's have another example. Let's add a noise top and if we go to the type, we see that for every type of noise, there is an integer value assigned to it. Like for Perlin 2D, we have 0, Perlin 3D is 1, Perlin 4D is 2, and so on. So let's say we have Perlin 2D and we want to change it to Perlin 4D programmatically. I will comment this line out so this code will not be executed. I will copy it down here to save time and I'm going to change the name to noise2. We're still accessing a parameter with .par but now we're not accessing the face anymore but rather the type. So I'm gonna say .type and I'll put here a round value which for Perlin 4 d was 2. And now when I execute this with command R we'll see that the noise changed to 2. So now we're getting an idea on how to control the operators. But what is it if we don't always want to control the script manually? What if we could have an operator be the executor of our code? What if this could get done with a chop? And what if we have a chop execute? Let's see how this is done. Let's add a button comp here first. Let's set the button type to momentarily. Okay, let's attach a null and if we put the button viewer active and click on it, then the null reacts from 0 to 1 and then back. This is caused by the momentary type. If we put the type to toggle up, then every time we click the button, it goes to 1 and for it to go back to 0, we have to click on it again, much like turning on and off a lamp. So it's good that we know what's possible because the type of button depends on the type of the scenario we have. For now, I'll leave it to momentary. So let's say that every time I click on the button, I want the seed to get a new value, a random value. In order to do this, we need the chop execute. So every time the null goes from 0 to 1, I want to execute a script. So first we drag the chop execute to the second screen and open the dot. Here we can see the touch designer already has some predefined functions that we don't need to write ourselves. And in order to activate them, we go here on the parameter window and activate which type of function we want. So we want to execute when it goes from 0 to 1 or from off to on. So we'll activate this and deactivate the value change and in the script we will delete everything but the function we need, which is the off to on. Let's also delete the comments. So now we only have the one function and this function is going to get called every time that the button goes off to on. Let's print here on to off trigger so we make sure it's working. Now, if I click on the button and I check here on the text board, nothing happens. And this is because we need to decide here which chop are we going to listen for. So we need to drag the null chop in here. And now every time I click here, we see that the code gets executed and the function gets called. So now we can reference this noise and have the seed change randomly between 1 and 10,000. In order to do this, we go up here and say import random, which is the default library for creating random values. And then let's delete this line and create a variable here. Let's call it random seed. And this is going to be random.randint. And this is going to go from 0 to 10,000 or 1 to 10,000. If you're still watching and not understanding what is really going on, but you are interested in knowing more, then you can stop the video now and maybe go on YouTube and search for some Python or programming beginner videos and try to understand more, learn a bit more about programming, and then come back and rewatch this part of the tutorial and learn more about Python and Touch Designer. Otherwise, let's just move on. Great, now we have our random seed value. We need to set it to this noise too. 
To do this, we say op, which is the operator function. Then we say the name of the operator, which is nice too. And then we can say dot par dot. And then we can look at how the parameter is called. In this case, it's seed. And this is going to be equal to our random seed. We don't need the return statement, so let's delete that. So there we go, just three lines of code. And then every time I click on the button, the seed value changes. And if we move the noise here, then we can see the changes visualized. So now you start to see the power of Python in Touch Designer that we can control any operator and any parameter. So let's say we want the face to change randomly next. Let's comment these lines out and let's see this other example. I'm gonna type in random face as a new variable is equal to random dot random. And in this case, random is a function that returns a random value only between zero and one. So we don't need to put the parameters here in the brackets since our face also only goes from zero to one anyways. And then let's type op and then the name of the operator, which is run for and then dot par dot face equal to random face. And there we go. Every time we click on the button, we get a random face between zero and one. Great, so what have we learned? We learned that with this operator, we can execute our code by right clicking and selecting run script, while the chop execute can execute the code under these conditions based on chop values. Now let's see the table operator. This is like an Excel table. And if we put a viewer active, here we can put values inside the table. In the parameter window, we can set the exact dimensions of the table with number of rows and columns and also manipulate the information inside the cells. So let's have an example. Let's say every time I press a button, I want to change here in the first row this cell right here. The cell in row 1 and the column with the index 2. Then what we can do? Let's comment this out and let's prepare a new variable. Random table value equals random dot rand int. And this is going to be from, I don't know, 1 until 200. And then we can talk to this table. We can say op the name of the table, which is table 1. And then we can access each cell with this syntax of the squared brackets. And here we can pass two values, where 0, 0 would be row 0 and column 0. But we want it row 1 and column 2. So first goes the row index and then the column index. And then we say dot val and we want this to be equal to random table value. Okay, and every time I click here, we get a new random value from 0 to 200. It's great that we can do this, but you may be asking yourself why this is useful. So let's see another example. If we zoom in our ramp, we can see this little pink arrow down here. And if we click on it, we see that there's actually a table here running the colors. And if we manually change the color here, then the values in the table are also changing. If we remove the color altogether, the values go to zero. If we change this other color, then the other values change, and so on. So this table drives the colors of the ramp. So there are possibilities here. We can use a table dot to randomly change the ramp colors. So first, let's rename this table to random colors. And if we move in here, we can see the first row has pos, r, g, b, and a. And the second row is the position of the color. So if I select the color right here, we get this value, 0 0.5 something, since this color is somewhere in the middle of the ramp. Here is 0 0.8 something, and here is 0 0.1 something. And every time I add a new one, then in the table, a new row gets added. Let's first do it with two colors as a base, and then it's going to be easy to duplicate. Now this table has five columns, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And that's the amount of columns that we need here. And then we can go ahead and name the colors the same as here, which is pos, r, g, b, and a. I will delete this value, and we said we're going to start with two colors, so 0 and 1. And we're going to fill the values here in the middle. Let's also put the alpha to 1 so we don't have any transparency. And we're left with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 values that we want to change randomly. So I will comment out these lines and then we're going to create 6 variables. R1 for the first value and this will be equal to random.random .random, since we need a value from 0 to 1. The same for R2. Then G1 is also going to be random.random. .random. 
g2 will also be random dot random b1 random dot random b2 random dot random and there we have our six variables now we just need to reference them so we'll say op and then the name of the operator random colors and the first one will be one one so that val and this is going to be r1 let's do the same for the value in 2 1 and this is going to be the r2 and let's copy the expressions here two more times and replace for g1 and g2 and this is going to be b1 and b2 and we just need to replace the columns the rows stay the same so here we have 1 2 and 2 2 and down here we have 1 3 and 2 3 and there we go every time we click on the button we get here the random values we wanted but we still don't see the colors changing so we need to reference this to the ramp so let's just drag and drop it so now this is the first row and this is the second row and with a button we can select different random gradients which can be very useful and as i said we now only have two colors for simplicity if you have a bit more of experience in python then you can do endless colors and endless gradients but for now that goes beyond the purposes of this tutorial the last that i want to explain here is the folder that if we click on it here in the parameter window we can select a root folder i've selected a folder with some vj loops and if we zoom here on the node, we can see our loops listed with the corresponding name and path. We can use these paths to load movie files in. So let's attach here a movie file in. This operator needs a file path. And let's say, for example, we want to add loop number one or loop number two. Then what we can do is let's reuse our chop execute we have here to access these paths in our folder. So we're going to delete the code we don't need and if we now want to use the first loop we're going to access its path and use it as a movie file in so let's type in op and the name is folder one and this right here is a table so we need the squared brackets to access the first row which is the first parameter and the path is the second parameter which for the first loop is also in the first column and then dot val to get the values we'll save this as a variable file path and now we want to load this movie file in with this path so we'll write op and the movie file in two dot par dot and then we go to the parameter window to check the name which is file and this will be equal to our file path the variable we just declared for the first loop so now when i click on the button the first loop of my folder will load into the movie file in if i change here the one to four then the fourth loop will get loaded so we learned here that we can load external files with python and it's very straightforward you can have multiple of these file in and then cross them or switch them to make whole new animations now before we move on to the comps i want to show you how you can get help regarding python through the touch designer documentation here we have the op class the most abstract class meaning all the other classes inherit these properties in here we have several parameters and function we can access so let's say for example we want to access the digits then we go to touch designer and let's first go to the text board and clear out what we did before and here we're going to attach any operator we want so for example a circle and then we can type here op and then just drag and drop the circle node in here like this we have the path and then we type dot digits and if we execute now then we get three and the dot digits we got from here like this we can use any of these other members and they apply to all operators no matter if they're chops or chops or sops or any of the other operators the same procedure goes for the name id or really every other parameter from the op class this class is shared by all operators and then we have other specific parameters for each of the operator families chops have for instance width and height so for our circle we can get here the width and the height and this only applies for the tops let's see if we create here for example a constant chop and try to do the same op and then drag and drop the constant to get the path dot width then we get an error that there is no attribute called width that applies to our chop operators as we can see here in the official documentation of the chop class 
if we scroll through there is no width and no height so let's recap we have attributes that apply to all our operators independent on which class they belong to and then we have class specific attributes that apply only to tops only to chops only to sops dots and there can also be other components that are only specific for one operator like for movie file in so let's go to the documentation here and let's see how file height for example works file height only applies to movie file in and here we can say op and then string and drag and drop the node and then dot file height and so we get here our value now if we were to use file height on our circle we would get an error so even if two operators are in the same class they might also have specific attributes that only apply to one and not the other and like this we can understand the abstraction level the touch designer has meaning we move from the op class our mode's abstract level applying to every single operator then we have class dependent abstraction applying to every operator within the same class and lastly we have operator specific functions or methods that only apply to a specific top or chop and so on also one thing i would like to clarify here is if we did the same thing in the text part as we did before that we just type op string and then circle three dot par and then any type of parameter let's say for example rotate it will throw us an error and this happens because here we're in project one and this needs to be specified as a path in our code if you guys remember when we learned that dots let's illustrate this we're going to attach a text dot here we can clear this out and just copy the line from up here and we're going to paste it with a text dot we're going to print it and then it will give us a value This, on the other hand, worked without us having to give the path. Why did this happen? When we have a script in the same level of the network, then we don't have to give the absolute path. We can just reference the circle directly. Whereas the text part is global in Touch Designer. That means that in order to access operators from the terminal, we need to give the absolute path, like op projection slash circle three dot par dot rotate. And if we delete this, then it's not going to work. This is important information to understand the hierarchy within Touch Design. So now that we got that, we'll move on to the comps. So let's recap. We have seen up to now the tops, which are pixel based and have a resolution. We have learned the chops, which are channel and sample based. We have learned the SOPs, which are 3D objects in a 3D space. We have seen our materials for the geometry. We have seen the dots, which have text and tables and scripts. And in the comps, we have seen the camera, the geometry and the light, which are important for the rendering of the SOPs and tops. And we also saw what we can do with the button comp. But there are other operators in the comp class, like the slider. If we connect the slider to a null and put it viewer active, then we can slide it here. But what does this really do? If we were to add here a circle and we wanted to change the border width, for example, then we drag and drop the null to the border width. We select shop reference and like so we could slide here to change its value. Let's have another example. I will add here a circle, a ramp and a composite. and I want to multiply them. So let's say I have a network and I'm happy with it. And I've noticed up to now, or maybe I'm predicting that I will often use this network in the future. So I want to make it into a custom component. One way to do this is with a base that I drag and drop everything into the base. Another way would be by selecting all the operators and I right click and I go to call up select. This will automatically create a base for me. Let's delete this other base and we'll go into our base too. Here I have the network. This network can have the in and I can connect the circle to the in as a default input in case I don't give it another in. If something else is given, then I will use that. Then in the end, I will attach a node. Now if we scroll out here, we have the base. And if I turn the viewer on, we have our circle. To illustrate how the in works, now if I attach 
a rectangle, then our base will update into a rectangle. And we can attach here another node for our new network. And in our original network, we can still perform more complex operators. Like we can attach a displays, and to it we can attach a noise, and we can set here different values. And everything we pass here in this network, it will go through all the operators and give us a new output. This is very useful. But if we click on the base 2, we here see that we don't have much control on what is happening. There are no parameters here. So for example, if I want to change the displays weight without going directly to the displays node, but rather be able to do it from here, I cannot do that from now. So what we can do is right click here, go to customize component, and we have here now a component editor with our own custom parameters which we can add. So let's say we want to control the ramp phase. So we just type in ramp phase, add parameter, and here we can set range min and range max. By the way, the range min and max segment is a soft restriction, while we also have the clamp min and max, which is a stricter restriction. Let's put the range min to minus one, and we're not going to clamp this for now. And we see that as soon as we added the new custom parameter, it will appear here in the custom page of our base too. And if we click on it, we also have a Python name, which we can access with a Python script. And we also have the slider with a range from minus one to one. Another way to do this is if we scroll into our base two and in the parameter window, we can drag this displays weight and dropping it into the custom parameters here will also do it. Create a new custom parameter, which will also be added in the custom page of the base two parameter window. This allows me to control the displays weight from the outside like this, and this actually has a direct effect on our shape because we link the parameter to the shape. Whereas the ramp phase parameter here does not have an effect yet since we only added the custom parameter, but we didn't link it yet. Now we could have just done it like we did with the displays weight and drag and dropped it, but I want us to see another way that might be useful in other cases. So here in the phase, we can type in me, which is a global variable in touch designer to access the operator in which we're writing the expression which in this case is the ramp and then dot parent with the brackets as a function. And in this case, we're referencing the base two operator. So once again, me dot parent with the brackets dot par because we want to access a parameter. And then we can say dot and then the name of the parameter we assigned, which is ramp face with a big R and then dot by. What this line did right here is allow us to control the phase by linking the phase of the ramp to the new custom parameter we created. So now we know both ways of customizing our component. Either we create a brand new component and we manually assign its link or we directly bind it to the parameter. What we did here can be very useful because once we have a component we find useful, we can rename this to my useful component, for example, or another name that's more unambiguous. Then we can go to my palette, my components, and in here we can right click, add components and name these two useful components. This will create a new folder and then we can drag and drop here our new components. And once we do this, we can drag and drop the component as many times as we want and reuse it instead of having to repeat the same steps over and over. So now we know we have encapsulated every type of functionality we find important in a component and have it forever in our palette. So this was a friendly introduction in the comps. Now we have the most important knowledge regarding our operators in all six families. For the next part, we're going to gain an understanding of some important techniques. Let's talk about instancing. Instancing is a technique where we draw many objects at once with a single render call, saving us all the CPU to GPU communications every time we need to render an object. We will see how instancing works with tops, softs and chops by trying to recreate the exact same outcome with the different operators. To demonstrate this technique, first I'm going to create an empty base comp. I'll go inside the base comp and I'm going to create a basic rendering network. First I will create a box and then I'm going to right click to attach a geometry. Then I'll press tab and while holding shift I'll add a camera and a light. Press tab to add a render and then connect the render to an out. To see the render, I'm going to split the screen and I'm going to select here top viewer. 
Let's also make the right screen uh, smaller and if you don't see anything yet, it's because the render flag here needs to be turned on. Now with the instancing, we will create copies or instances of this box driven by a soft, a chop or a top. Let's see what this means. First, I'm going to decrease the size of the box, like this. And then I'm going to create a line shop. We didn't see the line shop yet in this tutorial, but this is basically just a line. This line has an amount of points, which is now 2, but we can increase it to 3 or higher. And the line goes from 0 to 1. And in here we can also set the line to begin from another value, like minus 1. If we switch to top viewer, we can see here in the coordinate system that the line goes from minus 1 to 1. Now I can attach this to a null and rename this to soft position. So now our line has three points, one in minus one, then one in zero, and then one at the end on one going from minus one to one through the three points. Number of points is the important parameter here as long as instancing is concerned. So let's say I want to have three copies of the same box, one here, one in the middle, and one right here. So to do this, I will click on geometry, go to instance in the parameter window, and I'm going to turn on the instancing. Let's first focus on the translate operator. I'm going to drag the operator and drop it on the translate op. The operator, like we said, can be a sop, a chop, or a top. So now that we did that, we're going to translate it in the x direction. Sop operators have a property P0, which stands for the x position. P1 is the y and P2 is the z. Since the line is only going in the one direction, we don't need these parameters, so even if we set them, it wouldn't make a difference. Now if I go back to the line and increase the number of points, then the number of boxes will also increase in accordance to the number of points. Let's make the size a bit smaller so we can better illustrate this. And so we can create 10 boxes or 50 or more until we only see a line. For now, let's reset the values we had before. Now this operator here doesn't have to be a line, it can also be another sop for example, like a box sop. We can pass the box here and now we have a box made out of boxes. And if we go to the geometry viewer we can better recognize this. Remember we saw this before, that if we go here, right click and go to the display options, we can select the points. And then we can see that for each point a box is being created. Let's go back to the line and get rid of the box sop for now. The same as the line, we could also change the shape of the box up here into a sphere box. And now the shapes being instantiated change and we get three spheres instead. Let me size them down so we can see better. Let's go back to the box and now what we could also do is decrease the size of the box to very low. So let's say 0.1 and then change the overall shape to a sphere. And then we get this nice looking shape. This is very powerful because we can move in with a camera and have an animation around this or animate the sphere itself. To give an example, you could also add a noise here and have this cool morphing sphere made out of boxes. If you want to see another example of this, I will link another similar short tutorial we did on this in the description box and you can check that out later. Let's reattach the line. We're going to switch back to top viewer and I will delete these extra nodes. So let's move on now. Let's say we don't want to move this with the sub data, but instead with chop data. So let's see how this works. I will attach a pattern chop and set the type to run, since we want the increasing elements. The pattern goes from 0 to 1, but it has a length of a thousand. So if we would do the instancing like this, we would get a thousand boxes here, and for the demonstration we want only three boxes. So we just set the length to three. And if we also want the line to go from minus one to one instead of zero to one, then we can set the offset to minus one. So this is where the line will start. And for it to go until one, the amplitude needs to be at two instead of one. So now the line goes from minus one to one through these three points. I'm going to create a null here, and like we did before, I will rename this null to chop position. And now we can replace our sop position with chops. In here we get an error which states that P0, P1 and P2 do not exist. This happens because in chops we're working with channels. So we need to get rid of the Y and Z and set the translate X to channel 1. If we go here to the pattern and in the channel window we set the name to px, we will get the same error, since channel 1 does not exist anymore. So we go back here to the translate and set it to tx. 
So what's important to remember here is that the parameter needs to match with the channel name in chops and in SOPS it can be P0, P1 or P2. The similarity here is as we did with the line, we can also here increase the number of samples. We could also change the type of the pattern to sign. Right now it's a sign in the X direction. If we want to put it in the Y direction, we go to the geometry and also put TX in the translate Y. And then we get this line. Let's see another scenario. Let's say we want this pattern to be a ramp. We're going to copy paste it and rename the channel name to TY. In this second pattern, we want to be a sign pattern. In here, we can then insert a merge operator and we're going to connect both patterns to it. And now we have two channels and in the geometry, we can set a value TY for the translate in the Y direction. Now we see our geometry has this shape. We don't see it on the top viewer and this is because of the position of the camera. But if we go to our second pattern and reduce the offset to begin at zero and have the amplitude set at one, then we can see our geometry. Now that we saw what's possible here, I'm going to delete the second pattern, the merge operator, I'm going to delete the TY to get rid of the error and set the length back to three. Up to now, we've seen how to instance this line of three boxes using SOPs and CHOPs. So let's see how we can create this with ramps. This is very important. The first thing we do here is change the resolution to three pixels by one pixel. Now the line is not looking like the three boxes we saw before. To fix this, we go to the viewer smoothness. This controls pixel filtering in the viewer. We set this to nearest pixel and we get the boxes one right after the other. Let's put this viewer active, right click on the node and select display pixel values. Here we can now see some important values, namely our RGB values for each of the boxes. Now same procedure as before, before I plug it into the geometry, I will right click to attach it to a null and I'm going to rename the null to top position. Now I'm going to drag and drop it here to the translate X and once again I will get the same error, with the difference the tops have R, G, B and A data. Now the boxes are looking a little weird here on the side. Why does this happen? This happens because by default the pixel format here is set to 8-bit fix and this can only store values between 0 and 1 for each of its R, G, B and A channels. And we want it to be a 32-bit float for it to also receive negative values. We need a pixel format that is not bound to the 0, 1 range. Instead, it can go to negative and above 1. If we do this alone though, it was still not going to change anything, since the values go by default from 0 to 1. Instead, we want it to go from minus 1 to 1. We can fix this by adding a math to help us change the range from 0 to 1 to minus 1 to 1. And there we have our cubes. What is essential to understand is that if we go here to the viewer smoothness and change to nearest pixel, then our first two boxes for our eye will be black. But if I put the node viewer active and press the D key, we can see that the first two pixels have a negative value. So to our eyes they look the same, but they entail different kind of information. If we were to go back to an 8-bit fixed format, then the first pixel, its value will start from 1, because the current pixel format does not allow values that are lower than 0. So this is why the 32-bit float format is important. In essence, we are using the pixel values as data to set the position of our boxes. Meaning, this data is the 1, this right here is the 0, and this is the minus 1. And now all the information with the bits from here makes sense. But here in the ramp, we could also manipulate the translation of the boxes in the X direction by changing the colors like this. We can also manipulate the translate Y with our G value. And in the same way, now the colors will be driving the positions of the boxes. This is the main idea of the top instancing. This can be a lot of fun if we, for instance, create a noise here. With a noise, we need to be particularly careful because if we put a very high resolution and we're working on a computer that is not very powerful, then the computer might crash. So I'll just put a 20 by 20 noise and you can see here it's very pixelated, but that is fine. I'm going to change the pixel format in here also to a 32-bit float and in the noise, I'll change it to monochrome. 
and finally connect it to our network and we get some noisy position boxes, which can be fun to experiment with. Ok, let me get rid of these nodes, put the ramp back to white and delete the G value. So up to here we saw that we can create different instances of one box or one shape and this could be driven by subs, by chops or by tops and we can get the same outcome by changing the parameters of each one. For more advanced uses we can also use other components to rotate, scale or pivot we can change the color mode or the rotation vector, but for now we have the basics of the instancing. So we covered the core components of Touch Designer. Next we are going to have a look at how we can work with audio on Touch Designer. Let's start by going to Chops and adding an audio file in. We could also create an audio device in case we're working with a microphone or a sound card. But for now we'll work with just the basic audio file. This is a default Touch Designer audio. Right now we don't hear anything and the reason for this is we have no audio device out. So let's go to Chops and add one. And now we can listen to the music. I'm going to bypass it for now so we don't hear the sound while we're working. In here, in the audio file in, we have some signals. And what we want to do is extract meaningful data out of the audio file signals and use this data to drive other parameters in the network. There are many ways to do this. Let's first go to the audio file in and turn the mono on to output only one channel. So it's easier for us to work with. Now one way to extract the data is with an audio spectrum chop, which displays the spectrum in a more understandable way by emphasizing the higher frequency levels and the lower frequency ranges as we can see here. This could be useful in the example we saw with the instancing, so we could use the spectrum to instantiate and have some audio visualization. Now let's say we want to compress this spectrum to a value, then we just add an analyze which looks at the values of all the values of the channel and outputs a single number result. We can set here the function to RMS power and now we have some kind of value. We can then connect the analyze to the mat and multiply it by let's say 10 or maybe 10 is too much so let's say 5. We will attach all of this to a null and rename it to naive extraction. To visualize all this, we can add here a circle top and map the naive extraction to the radius of the circle. And then we see the circle reacting to the music. This way is not the most precise, so let's see another way we can do the data extraction using components from the palette. We then go to Tools, Audio Analysis and we're going to drag and drop it to the screen. Here we can plug in our audio source and if we zoom in we have here the lows, mids and highs of the audio. If we attach here a null we can see here all our different channels and we can use any of these different channels to map different parameters. So let's rename this null to audio analysis and let's copy paste this circle. Let's move them both down here to see the differences and for this one we will use the lows to drive the radius of the circle. So we have here two different types of visualization. If any of the visualizations are too strong, we can add here a filter chop and smooth out the effects. And we can do the same up here and change the values until it fits. There is also another approach to working with audios, which is to dissect the signal yourself to extract meaningful data. To do this, let's copy paste the audio spectrum. Here we have the spectrum that is coming in and we can add a filter. In the parameter window we have a low pass filter and set the cutoff units to frequency. And if we decrease the filter cutoff to very very low, then we're only extracting these frequencies. And if we go really high, then we're not extracting anything. So now we can have different kind of filters. Let's say we want this to be low, around 50, and I will rename this to low frex. I will select them both and copy paste them down here. And in this filter, we instead set it to high pass filter and put the cutoff higher. And we have here the low frequencies and down here we have the high frequency. Okay. 
we do the same as above and also attach here an analyze with rms power as a function copy paste the analyze down here and this is another way to work with audios if we find the values to be very low then we can attach a math here with which to multiply the values and multiply as high as you want the data to be. And we could add more filters and to visualize, let's have two more copies of the circle and we will map each of the analyzes to the radius of the corresponding circle. And down here we're mapping the high frequencies and up here we're mapping the low frequencies. So we have now the basics of how to work with audio, how to extract the information we need, and whichever of these methods we use depends on the situation and it's up to you to choose from. Great, so all in all, we now have the base of Touch Designer. The operators, how are they different, how we can work with them to create animations, how we can work with audio, and we can recreate simple animations, or we could have original visions and can somehow imagine how certain things can be achieved. Most importantly, we know what is possible. And if we don't know something, then we at least know how to Google the questions and how to look for the answers. For the next part, I'm going to insert some random knowledge that either didn't fit in the structure of this tutorial at first, or maybe I forgot to mention. I will give this information in no specific structure, rather I will explain a couple of things I think might be useful and will be good to have heard of at least. Now we saw three of the families, tops, chops and sops and how are they different. At the end of the day it's important to understand that what we're dealing with is just data. This data is just interpreted differently in Touch Designer through these families. What do I mean by this? I'm going to illustrate this with a circle top. If I right click here, I can attach an operator that transforms the circle top into chops. The first thing we notice when we do this are the RGBA channels. So the top to chop converts pixels in a top image to chop channels. It generates one chop channel per row in the image and a pixel color element. So these RGBA channels we see here are only representing the first row of pixels of the original top. Now, if we go to crop, we can specify what we want to extract from the image. Let's select full image and now we have a bunch of channels. We have one of each channels for each row of the top image. To reorganize these samples in a set of channels, we will attach here a shuffle chop. The shuffle chop is useful for transforming data received by the top two chops into channels containing only one row or column. This data can then be easily manipulated and transformed back if needed. We will organize the channels here by name and we get this representation. So this circle top is now transformed into this chop. Now to check that everything is right, let's attach a chop to top. The chop to top does the exact opposite and puts chop channels into a top image. The data format parameter determines how the input channels are converted into pixel colors in the output image. Since the data format of the chops is RGB and A, then we also need to put the data format here to RGBA. Here we also need to change the image layout, which controls the dimensions of the output image and how the chop samples are arranged as pixels. We need the pixels to be arranged so that they can fit to square. At the end, we get the exact same image we had at the beginning. This giving us a proof on how the top to chop and chop to top work without any information getting lost. Let's have another experiment of what else can we do here. Let's add here a null and drag and drop it to the chop to so it's being referenced. Then we add a noise and in the channel names we type in R, G, B and A. We then add a resample, we turn the time slice off and to resample the shuffle we connect it to the resample and in the parameter window we set the sample rate to same rate new interval. What we achieve is that we go from 601 samples we had in the noise to 60,001 samples we had in the shuffle. Why did we do this? By doing these steps we can add a math and distort the output image. So let's right click and attach a math. 
and then attach it to the resample. Set the combined channels to off and combined shops to add. And then we get this image that we can further modify through the noise. And this is another interesting way to add new effects by increasing or decreasing the harmonics or changing with the value of the amplitude. So this network helps us understand how we can get top images, distort them in the chop world and have the effects reflect back on the top world. Now another useful information here is if I right click on tops to convert to dots, that's impossible. There are no useful operators for us here. But what we can do is convert it to chops first to do the same thing we did here. So we go to crop, full image, add a shuffle to rearrange the channels and then sequence channel by name. Now we have the same thing we did before. We're going to close the network with a null and now here we can select chop to dot. So this will allow us to get chop channel values into a dot in table format like so. So now in here we have a table of RGBA values. The reason why so many of the values are zero is because our original image has a lot of transparent alpha. If we turn off the bypass on the math, then we can see here we have different values on the dot table. And this data can be useful for us. We can filter it out or manipulate it to fit our purposes. Let's delete the chop to dot for now and let's add a chop to sop. Here we now get an error warning that happens because tx, ty and tz cannot be found. We need to rename these parameters to r, g and b for our channels and now we see some kind of 3D image, which is nothing else than the representation of these colors in the SOP world. We can attach here a null and go back to chops. Attach another null and go back to tops with RGB as our data format. This just to illustrate how easily we can go from tops to chops to sops. And in between of these conversions, we can modify and transform. We can attach here a noise to the sops, for instance, which will animate our 3D shape. And at the same time, animate the colors in our final top which happens because the noise has by default an expression here. And now that we're talking about expressions, we see here a powerful one we can apply to animate over time. And we can type that also on other parameters to animate. It's useful to remember this expression as it's very versatile. Let's see it on another example. If we right click here to attach a transform, we can rotate the image with this slider, but we can also add the expression abstime.seconds and we can multiply this expression by 20. And this will automatically rotate the image over time. And this was easily done with the expression. We can also access other operator values with this. So let's say we'll add here a constant chop and I want to translate it by 0.5. If we right click here, we see the value zero. And what we can do is take this value and go to transform and in the translate x, we type op and we reference the operator first, which is constant one and then dot par dot value zero dot val and there we have 0 0.5 which is the value we set and if i go back to constant and move the slider then i have control over this another way to access this is with a chan function because here with the expression we're accessing this parameter but this job also has channels so we could instead delete this and access it by typing chan and then the name of your channel, which is chan1, and we get the same result. So just another way to achieve the same thing. Now, what should you take away from this part? We can convert data from one family to another, and the data stays preserved. And then we can transform and modify this data in different families to get different effects. Some more interesting information would be regarding particle systems. Let's create a sphere and right click here to attach a sort which allows us to sort points in different ways. The points we're talking about here are the points out of which the sphere is made. So if we go back to the sphere, put it viewer active, right click for display options and select the points, these are the points we will sort. So let's go back, right click on the sort and add a particle sort. Here we see that the particles are moving in an ordered way. And with the sort, we can set the particles to move in a random way. And we can also play with the force, width, turbulence parameters, and we can even set the number of particles we want to have. 
or play around with all these other parameters. Now to render this, let's attach a null and then our render network made out of a geometry, a camera, a light. And then add a render top and right click to add an out. Let's split the screen and put it to top viewer. We're going to make the screen smaller and turn on the render flag on our out top. We can barely see the particles here. This happens due to this error that a material is missing. So let's insert a material and then we're going to drag and drop it to the geo select parameter material and the warning will go away. Now that we're here, let's see some image filters from the palette. I will first create the feedback edge. Let's also add the twirl and the light tunnel. Let's first attach the feedback edge to our network. I'm going to turn the background to black for us to see the effects better with a transform. The alpha to one and comp over background color to on. We can now see here that the feedback edge gives us some power. Just by adding this and playing with the parameters from here or adding some wind to the particles or some turbulence and we already have a cool animation. After the feedback, let's have a look at the twirl. The twirl warps a top image in a swirling pattern originating from a center point and we can set this center point to be anywhere. Then we also have the light tunnel or any of these other image filters here. You can google around which filters look interesting to you, but generally the image filters are fun to play with and offer endless possibilities. And once you're more advanced, you will get more curious and go inside these components to see how these are made and get some insights on how to create them yourself. Let's also see now what the light tunnel can do. The light tunnel selects a circle in the input top and extends the color of the edges to stretch across the rest of the image. You can decrease or increase the radius and that's it. With few operators, you did something so crazy. We can always go back and change values or we can sort by X and not always are we going to see a change in the animation itself because of the effects, but we can notice the change on the particle node here, for example. What we could also do is attach here another noise operator. If you notice here, my FPS is very low and there is a way to save some computing power if we select all the nodes and turn off the viewer active. Then we see a significant increase in the FPS. And yes, this was just some random knowledge. Maybe before we end the tutorial, we could also see how the feedback systems work. Let's create here a circle and first let's get rid of the fill and we'll make the border color white. Let's increase the border width so we get an empty circle. Let's connect it to the null and let's connect the null to the out so we can see here what we're doing. We're going to increase the resolution of the circle, which right now is very low. Let's also set the width a little smaller. Now the idea I have with the feedback is I want to repeat this frame multiple times. And with each repetition, I want to apply a transformation. Let's first attach another null, maybe because later we want to attach another component. Let's rename this to input, so this will be the input of the feedback. And now we can finally add the feedback top. I usually use the feedback with a transform and a level. You will see later why I'm using this. Let's also add a displays that I'm going to bypass for now and also a compose act. I will attach the circle to the composite and let's set here the operation to over and then drag this to the feedback. And this is what we call a feedback system, which right now doesn't have any visible effect of the image because there is no transformation happening. So we have a feedback of the same image. But if we go to the transform and scale down just a little bit, then we see the feedback going into the middle. And with changing the scale, the feedback will go until the end. But right now the feedback is not applying all the changes, so we need to reset it from time to time. Or an easy way to have it reset is with a keyboard in CHOP, and by default the key is 1. So if we press 1 on the keyboard, we see that the channel goes from 0 to 1. 
and we can put this viewer active and drag and drop it to the false and select shop reference. So every time I press one, it gets reset it. And from here, I can still always lower or increase the scale of the transform and reset it to see what is happening. Let's make the background black again. And with a level, we can make the transform disappear in the middle by lowering the opacity somewhere in between 0 and 1 to achieve this effect. We have endless versions here. If we, for example, want to change the circle to a triangle, then we can get another image and we can go to transform and have it rotate by degrees. And if we go back to the circle, then we lose the rotation. And the displays we didn't see in this network yet, but if we attach a noise to its second input, then it's going to mess up everything at first since the weight is way too high. So I will first set it to zero and work my way up slowly from there until it looks nice. We can also play with the parameters of the noise here to achieve different effects. This was just to illustrate how a feedback system could work, which parameters we could change. We could also add many other operators here. Some of them might not work, some might have crazy results, but I still encourage you to try it out yourself and have fun with it. And with this random knowledge, we have arrived to the end of the tutorial. This was a long one and I hope you made it until the end and you learned a lot and understood some things maybe you didn't understand before. I hope also that some other questions have a reason and that you have the tools now to search for the answers. And like always, you can ask them in the comments and we can make tutorials based on your suggestions. I will also reference some of our other tutorials in the description below, so you also have some more practical examples on the theory of this video. And lastly, thank you so much for watching and learning with us. It would mean a lot if you subscribe to the channel and check out our website. We have an online tool for creating generative images in there. And if you would like to support us in making more tutorials, I will leave our PayPal link for donations in the description. Otherwise, have a great time and I will see you in our next tutorial.